Welcome, and in this lesson, we're going to talk about Amazon Web Services Lambda. More specifically, we're going to cover core concepts we need to understand before moving on to hands-on topics. So first of all, what is Lambda? Lambda is a fully managed compute platform, but what does that mean? Let's explain this with an example. Let's say that you have a web app with user profiles and your users want the ability to upload their own images. So you set up an S3 bucket that will store user uploads. And then you start thinking about the code required to resize, crop, compress, and perform other changes to these images. Now that doesn't sound too complicated, but think about it further. Where are you going to store and execute this code? How are you going to listen to events that trigger the code? How will you handle exceptions? capacity planning in case of traffic surge, and what about securing your servers, updating them, and the host of other issues associated with servers? Now it doesn't sound as easy, does it? We are adding a lot of complexity. So that's where Lambda comes in. Lambda removes all of that infrastructure complexity, so all you have to worry about now is the code itself. You create a Lambda function and configure it to respond to an event like an S3 upload event in our example, and Amazon will execute your code. It actually executes on EC2 machines, but that doesn't really matter because Lambda functions are stateless. We don't care about the underlying infrastructure. Lambda functions could be executed on different machines every time as they are completely separate from each other. This makes it really easy to scale up and down depending on demand, which brings me to the next point. Lambda administration is completely automated. We don't have to worry about high availability and fault tolerance. Amazon worries about that for us. In fact, Lambda has built-in fault tolerance by replicating your code across multiple availability zones in each region. So even if there is a machine or data center failure, our code is protected. If there's an increase in demand, Amazon is in charge of scaling up and down to match that demand. They will also update and patch the operating system. Now, in addition to all of this, Lambda has built-in logging and monitoring through Amazon CloudWatch, which is something else we would have to build on our own otherwise, and that would add even more complexity. So this is what's so exciting about Lambda. It takes something complicated to implement and maintain, and it hides all of that complexity so you can simply plug in your code. Now, in order to run code, Lambda still needs to allocate CPU power, network bandwidth, and disk IO. Now, thankfully, this is something else automated by Lambda, which allocates the resources based on demand. However, we still need to allocate a certain amount of memory and an execution timeout, because this gives us the ability to control performance and costs, which are currently calculated based on the number of requests for functions and the time your code executes. The duration of time also includes the amount of memory allocated, so you can think of it as a gigabyte per seconds of compute time and so we still have to allocate these two manually. I would like to reiterate on the fact that Lambda functions are stateless, so persistent state needs to be stored in another cloud service like Amazon S3 and, or Amazon DynamoDB, for example. Amazon's Lambda supports three different languages at this moment, Node.js, Java, and Python. It also supports different Amazon platforms like Amazon DynamoDB, so for example, uh, an item in DynamoDB was edited, or DynamoDB kicked off an event of some kind, Lambda can execute a function on that event. It also supports Amazon Kinesis, so for example, messages arriving in a Kinesis stream, that kicks off an event, and again, Lambda executes on that event. Or Amazon S3, like in our example, and also Amazon SNS for messages. Going back to our user profile picture example we used at the beginning of the lesson, Instead of writing an image processing library, we can use an existing library like ImageMagick, for example. But how do we get ImageMagick in Lambda? Well, Lambda actually has some libraries pre-installed for certain languages. ImageMagick is available for Node.js, for example, and so is the AWS SDK for JavaScript. Python also has the Boto3 SDK available, but Java does not have any libraries. So if we need to use a library that's not available by default, we can manually include it. We will do this in another lesson. Now that we know what Lambda offers, how it works, and what it supports, let's get into the programming aspects. Because remember, Lambda puts the focus on your code, 
and when it comes to code inside of Lambda, there are core concepts to understand. Actually, there are four core concepts used regardless of the language we're using. The first core concept is the handler. The handler is the function that gets called when our Lambda, Lambda function is invoked. For example, in Python, my handler could be image.process, and that will tell Lambda to name our file image.py, or py, and to call the process function whenever our Lambda function gets invoked. If we didn't have a, a handler, Lambda wouldn't know what function to call. Now, the handler function has two parameters. So if you recall in my example, it's the, pro the function is called process. So process will have two parameters. The first parameter is event, which contains all event data. The second parameter is context, which we're going to cover in the next slide. But before we go on to that next slide, remember this, the handler processes event data. As I just said, the context is passed into the handler as a second parameter. The context is an object and it allows our code to interact with Lambda. For example, we can see how much time is remaining before AWS Lambda terminates our Lambda function, because if you remember, we set a timeout when creating our Lambda function. We can also interact with CloudWatch, as you see in the two examples down below. We can also get the AWS request ID returned to the client, which could be useful if we need to contact AWS support for whatever reason. And also, if the Lambda function was invoked through the AWS mobile SDK, we can learn more about the mobile application calling our function. So in a nutshell, the context lets our code interact with AWS Lambda. Another core concept to understand is that Lambda can log various metrics. These metrics get sent to Amazon's CloudWatch. These metrics include invocations, which is the number of times a function is invoked in response to an event or even an API call. And this includes successful and failed invocations, but not throttled attempts. Then we have errors, which measures the number of failed invocations that have a response code of 4xx, excluding error code 429, which is the error code for exceeding default uh, concurrent limits. This metric also does not include internal service errors. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that we do have the ability to trigger a retry attempt on failure, and we can do this by handling the exceptions, or we can also do it or if, or it, it can also happen if an unhandled exception causes the code to exit, if there's an out of memory exception, a timeout, or even a permission error. Now the next metric is duration. This measures how much time has elapsed from when the function code started execution to when it stopped executing. And then we also have throttles, which measures the number of invocation attempts that were throttled because we exceeded our current limit. Now keep in mind, we can also send custom logs to CloudWatch and those will get matched to the corresponding execution, which can be very useful when debugging, for example, because we can console log the error message and data, and then we can go to CloudWatch and find it easily because all the Lambda functions are grouped and all the executions are in chronological order. The last concept we're going to cover in this lesson is handling exceptions. Exceptions happen, so it's important to understand the two different options we have when we do need to use them. The first option is a synchronous exception, and the second option is synchronous exception. The synchronous exceptions can be used to log errors to CloudWatch, but they do not return results to the caller. On the other hand, if the caller needs a result returned, then we have to use synchronous exceptions. So that ends the AWS Lambda Essentials. Go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson.